one of the most well-known verses in the Bible is the passage that Rick read for us just a moment ago. And it's found in 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 8, he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I think one of the reasons why this is such a popular verse, such a well-known verse, is because of the dramatic imagery that's being used in this verse. The issue of Satan being a lion that is on the hunt. And we're not talking like Simba lion, okay? We're not talking about, you know, Disney lion here. We're talking about a powerful, frightening beast. When my brother lived in uh, uh, Florence, Alabama, uh, the university that was there in Florence, uh, their team, uh, they were the lions. And they had a lion on their campus in a cage that you could go see whenever you wanted. And uh, Harry was telling Avon about the lion. And he said, it's a big lion. It's a big lion. And it, it could eat you if it wanted. And Avon said, I could beat it up. He said, really? You think you could beat it up? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. So if I took you down there to the lion, you'd get in the cage and punch that lion in the face. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd do it. And he goes, okay, let's go. And as a group, we got into the car, and we went down to the lion cage, and we saw that lion sitting there on his rock, warming himself in the sun, being lazy as male lions are, with his big mane, and his huge paws. No more the distance between me and you as we were between him, him and my son. And he's looking at him, and Carrie says, okay, these bars are, 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 I think these bars might be wide enough for you to squeeze through. Go ahead, Avon. Go punch the lion in the face. And Avon goes, well, I was just kidding. Thinking you can take on a lion and actually taking on a lion are two different things. The issue of Satan being described here as a lion, as a roaring lion, depicts a lion that is not only vicious, that is not only terrifying, that is not only physically imposing, but a lion that is proactive in the hunt. A lion that is not waiting for you to come to him, but is coming to you instead. And so, Peter warns us to be sober-minded, to be watchful. Verse 9, he continues, he says, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He tells us that Satan is a lion, and there's nothing that we can do about that. He's powerful. He's vicious. He is physically imposing. He's terrifying. But the only thing that we can do about that, there's nothing we can do about his nature. There's nothing we can do about his identity. There's nothing that we can do to remove his power that exists within of himself. But what we can do is instead of just sitting around waiting for him to come and get us, if he's going to be proactive, you and I can be proactive. If he's going to have his offense, you and I, we, we can have our defense. I want to talk to you this morning, and in that reference to that verse, about evangelism. Evangelism is something that we are putting a heavy lean on here at Metro Church of Christ, as all churches should. Because we have been given a great commission by our Savior. We have been given marching orders by the Son of God, who proclaims to us and tells us that all authority has been given to Him under heaven and earth, and He tells us by that authority to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's our job. That's our call. That's who we are. But that's a dangerous prospect. Why is it a dangerous prospect? Well, in that of itself can be terrifying at times. 
None of us like hearing the word no. None of us like hearing rejection. Sometimes we're afraid of approaching our friends, our family, our coworkers, because we're afraid of how we'll respond. I told a story about Ava, now I'm going to tell a story about Harmony. This past week in her school, she came up to, uh, uh, to Stephanie and said, I had the opportunity this week to tell somebody about Jesus. And I was so proud of her when she said that. <laughs> My heart, like the Grinch, grew three sizes that day. And Steph said, did you tell her? And she went, no. Why not? I was scared. I didn't know what she'd say. And Stephanie's response to her was like, well, wouldn't you, why would you be afraid of what she said? Jesus is awesome. Think about it. He was dead, and now he's not. That's amazing. Don't you want people to know about that? And she said, yeah, but I'm just scared. Now we hear that story and go, aw. But isn't that an emotion that we all feel from time to time? Not just something that is, is relegated only to an emotion that a child experiences. That's something that we experience each and every day when we are surrounded by coworkers, friends, and family who may be very strongly opinionated about their life choices and, and the decisions that they've made. And we know that if we confront them with truth, they may resent it. They may kick against it. They may get combative. But it's not only terrifying from that perspective. It's also terrifying from the perspective that we are actively going out into a place where Satan roams. And he's eating people. Left and right. Peter describes essentially the prospect of evangelism here in this passage as a minefield. Now can you imagine living surrounded by a minefield? Where it's safe in your house but right outside your door are the mines, and you don't know where they are. Terrifying, right? It would make going to 7-Eleven for some milk a ton more difficult. <laughs> you wouldn't just casually walk out your door, would you? No, you'd be fearful of it. Peter pulls no punches here. He tells us that, yes, you do live in a minefield. Yes, you do live in a lion's hunting ground. You live in the jungle, and he's ready to eat you. But the answer is to not become an introvert. The answer is to not just stay home. The answer is to learn where the mines are located. The answer is to learn the strengths of and weaknesses of that lion to learn how to defeat him. Wouldn't be a Jared sermon unless I talked about a movie, so here we go. You might be familiar with this film. It's on TV from time to time. I watch the edited version on TV. Uh, it's a movie uh, with Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin called The Edge. Are you familiar with this movie? And it's a movie about uh, the, these, this billionaire who is brilliant. He's, he's one of the smartest men on the planet. And him and his friend survive a plane crash in the wilds of Alaska. And they end up getting hunted by this Kodiak bear that has a taste for human flesh. <laughs> and they show the bear on several occasions. I don't know if you've ever seen a Kodiak bear or at least a picture of a Kodiak bear. They're not small. You don't go look at them and go, aw, you want to snuggle? It's like, essentially, the shark from Jaws with fur. It's this huge animal, and they're terrified of it. And for most of the movie, they, they just run, trying to get away from this bear. And then they realize they can't because the bear is stalking them. Until finally, Anthony Hopkins, the smart one, says, okay, I've decided what we're going to do. We're going to kill the bear. And his friend says, what? <laughs> We're, they have nothing. They have no guns. They have no firearms. They have, they have their clothes. That's it. And he says, we're going to kill the bear. And he says, I, we can't do that, man. And he looks at him and says, say it. Say it with me. We're going to kill the bear. He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill the bear. We're going to kill the bear. I'm, I'm going to kill the bear. And then there's like shouting it back and forth. We're going to kill the bear. We're going to kill the bear. And finally, the way they kill it is not by outfighting the bear, 
but by what? Outsmarting the bear. Because as ferocious as the bear is, as powerful physically as the bear is, as terrifying as the bear is, he cannot match the intelligence of man. You might be terrified of evangelism because it is a minefield. You might be terrified of evangelism because it is a lion's hunting grounds because there are lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. A little slow on the uptake, but we'll get there. We might be afraid of that because it's a terrifying prospect to get in the ring with the lion, to wander and discover where the mines are buried. So the answer, because we can't outfight Satan, he's more powerful than us by ourselves. We can't outfight him. We can't outpolitic him because he owns this world. This is his backyard, not ours. We can't outmaneuver him. He's got territory that we will never gain. So if we can't fight harder, what are we called to do? Fight smarter. October 30th, 1974. The rumble in the jungle. How many of you remember that? One of the most famous sporting events of all time. Arguably the most influential boxing, professional boxing event of all time. Taking place between two of the greatest boxers of all time, George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali had been stripped of the title for reportedly draft dodging, avoiding going to the Vietnam War. And because of his controversial political views, the American Boxing Commission stripped him of his title and revoked his license. Well, it was eventually earned and won by a friend of Muhammad Ali named Joe Frazier. Finally, Muhammad Ali was cleared of those charges and was able to box again, and he faced Joe Frazier again for the title, to reclaim the title that he never lost. But Mr. Frazier beat Muhammad Ali, retaining, and held on to it, all the while Muhammad Ali itching for another match against the champ to prove that he could beat Joe Frazier. Well, that was not to happen just yet because George Foreman, a young Olympic gold medalist boxer came along and handily defeats Joe Frazier. When Don King set up this fight, the favorite, even though Muhammad Ali is considered to be arguably the greatest boxer of all time, the favorite by far and large was who? George Foreman, because he was younger. He was bigger. He was stronger. He was more powerful. No one thought Ali could beat him. I mean, all you had to do was look at him. This poster kind of makes it look like they're the same size, but they weren't. Ali looked like a bean pole next to George Foreman. And everybody was saying, he's going to lose, he's going to lose, he's going to lose. Until that night, in Zaire, where they got into the ring. The bell rung, they left their corners, and Ali began to do the strangest thing. He would throw a couple of punches every now and then, but for the most part, he would put up his gloves, let himself get backed into the corner of the ropes, and just let Foreman hammer away at his midsection. Thunderous blow, wham! 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 As many as he could throw. His coaches, Ali's coaches, 
And, and his trainers in his corner were screaming at him, What are you doing? Are you insane? He's throwing sledgehammers and you're not moving out of the way. Get, move, fight back. And he would just stand there and take it. He does this for seven rounds. All the while, at the end of each round, after Foreman has leveled and hammered against Ali's midsection, Ali would tie him up right before the bell would ring, and he'd whisper into his ear, and he goes, what, come on, I, I thought they told me you could punch, George. They told me you were strong, that you were powerful. You could do better than that. And it just made Foreman angrier and angrier. And the bell would ring, and Muhammad Ali would come out. He'd put his gloves up, and he would just let George swing away like he was chopping down an oak tree. Until in the seventh round, you could tell that Foreman was tired, dragging. George Foreman would later tell us that during the seventh round, right after the seventh round ends, before he went into the eighth and final, what would be the final round, that Ali would wrap him up again and whisper to his ears, he goes, come on, George, what? Is that all you got? And George Foreman said to himself in the back of his head, he tells us that he answered that question, and he said, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> in the eighth round... Foreman comes out of his corner. Ali comes out of his corner. And instead of wrapping up this time, what does Ali do? Wraps up, blocks a punch, wraps up, and bam! And lays Foreman out. Now, Foreman didn't stay down. He got up, but not before the ref counted to ten. And Ali got his title back. That move is called the what? The rope-a-dope. You see, everybody knew that if Ali went and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Foreman, if he, if he matched him punch for punch, what would happen? He'd get his skull caved in. If he stood there, if he stood there and just let, and let Foreman and try to outfight Foreman, he'd lose because he was younger and he was stronger. And as fast as all he was, he couldn't compensate if he stood toe-to-toe. -to -toe, so what did he do? He couldn't outfight Foreman, so what did he do? He outthought him. It wasn't the punch that laid Foreman out and won Ali the title that night in 1974. It was the sharpness and the tactical genius of Muhammad Ali that won him the title. You see, the truth is, is that people are afraid of evangelism because they think that we are playing checkers. I know it's chess, don't worry. <laughs> they think we're playing checkers, but we're not. We're playing... You see, there's no strategy to chess. And before you argue with me and say there is, is essentially if you run across a bad guy, what do you do? You jump him. Hey, I got one. And then you stack them up and say, look, it's not really a game of strategy. It's a race to see who can get each other's pieces first. But chess, chess is a game of strategy. You see, if we play checkers with Satan, he's going to win every time because he's got more pieces than we do. He is stronger. He is faster. But he's not smarter. You see, Satan thinks that you're a failure. I can't tell you how many times that I've heard preachers go on and on about how brilliant Satan is, about how cunning, and he is cunning, but about how smart and intelligent he is, what a good tactician he is, what a good strategist he is. No way. He's powerful. I'll give it to him. We should respect his ability to destroy. But when it comes to outthinking his opponent, he's an idiot. And here's why. Because Satan thinks that you're worthless. 
Satan thinks that you're nothing. That you're worth nothing. That you're worth less than nothing. He thinks that you can't tie your shoes with both hands. He thinks that you could not find anything valuable, pleasant, worthwhile about who you are. Satan's whole campaign is built around convincing you that he's the lion, he's the king, and you're food. That's it. And I think he believes it. That doesn't make him tactically brilliant. That makes him a moron. Because God knows better. God knows that you are worthwhile. That you're not worthless. That you're worth dying for. And yes, brothers and sisters, maybe we can outswing Satan. Maybe he's got too many arms. <laughs> Maybe if we get in the ring and we stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and we try to out-punch Satan, we'll lose. That's true. But we don't have to out-punch Satan to win, do we? Do we? Just like Ali couldn't out-punch Foreman. He won by knowing he didn't have to. You see, all we have to do if we can't fight harder. And listen, have we hit failings where we've decided that, listen, I try as hard as I can and I still fail. You ever had that thought? I try not to sin. I try to leave a good lead a good life. I try to evangelize these people and they keep saying no and they keep coming back with arguments and they keep trying to want to debate instead of converse with me and I can't handle it. I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying as hard as I can and I'm still failing. Have you ever thought that? If you can't fight harder, don't give up. Don't throw off the gloves and say, I'm done, I'm out. It's over. I'm left with nothing else. You're not left with anything else because he can take your strength. But he cannot take away the deadliest weapon you have in your arsenal. Your mind. Going back to what Peter has to say. Turn back there again. Notice some of the language that Peter uses. He says, be sober what? Minded. Be watchful. He says in verse 9, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. After, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He says, be sober-minded. Know who you're up against. You know what the first rule is of the art of war? Have you heard of the Art of War, Sun Tzu? One of the greatest tactical texts written of, of in the history of military history. First rule is, know your enemy. Because the war isn't fought with these. It's fought with this. If you can dominate the mind, if you can control the psychology of your, of your opponent, doesn't matter how strong he is, doesn't matter how big he is, doesn't matter how furious he might get, you've already won. And Satan might be powerful, but we have a God who has made us smarter than him, who has made us valuable, and who has told us that if we, conform, if we avoid conforming to this world and we transform ourselves by the renewing of our mind, if we remain sober-minded, if we remember who it is we're dealing with, if we know our enemy, it doesn't matter if his attacks are against us, it doesn't matter if we're dealing with people 
around our world who are struggling with the information that we're giving them about Jesus Christ as Lord. It doesn't matter if we're involved in personal spirituality or evangelism. It doesn't matter what type of warfare we are fighting. We can win. So, without being too corny, what do you tell yourself when you're faced with the prospect of bringing Christ to another person? Stop playing checkers. Start playing chess. Look yourself in the mirror. Pick yourself up. As the Bible might tell us, gird up your loins. Get ready for battle. Look yourself dead in the eye and say, I'm going to kill the bear. And if it comes out squeaky as first, say it again. I'm going to kill the bear. And that little voice in the back of your mind that says, you can't kill the bear, look at the bear. As you repeat it again, I'm going to kill the bear. That voice will get quieter and quieter and quieter because as powerful as Satan is, we have the advantage of the mind because it's our mind that reminds us that as powerful as he is, our God is stronger. Amen? And he doesn't stand behind him. He stands behind us.